My name is Annegret Cantu. Um, thank you for inviting me today to Nomacorg. I'm going to talk, or actually I should introduce myself maybe a little bit more. So I've been working with Dr. Waterhouse for some time and I graduated in 2010 from his uh, laboratory. And uh, since then I also had some industry experience. And, but today I want to uh, talk about like um, bottling and post-bottling challenges in our uh, research winery at UC Davis. And I will give you a little outline, so I, a little introduction, then I will talk about bottling scenarios at UC Davis, um, monitoring oxygen, and um, strategy of sampling and validating a good bottling line, a little bit about chemistry, uh, the relation between SO2 and O2, and talk a little bit about uh, post-bottling oxygen management and some future research and collaborations. Um, yes, yeah, so why do we worry about bottling and post-bottling? Um, yeah, bottling has a significant impact of the contents of dissolved oxygen in wine. And um, yeah, post-bottling, uh, winemakers had minimal influence on the physically and chemically the dissolved oxygen in wine, but now this changes due um, new closures which are on the rise. Um, yeah, the, the problems with oxygen are that too much oxygen might cause serious defects and premature um, aging. Um, but you want a little bit of oxygen so that could benefit especially your red wine. Um, yeah, so how can you protect your wine from oxygen and, and premature aging? Um, you should really carefully set up your bottling line using inert gases and monitor your oxygen. And um, you should also consider to add the right amount of SO2. I will uh, go into that a little bit later. And uh, you, ch you choose your right closure post bottling. So this is just, this is just a, um, a graph which should give you some overview where oxygen can sneak in in, uh, in a bottling line. So um, you can see there were two wines bottled, but I would not pay too much attention uh, to this. It's just that you see that when your wine is transported, when your wine is fine, when your wine is cooled, filtered, blended, pumped, um, so in all these steps, there might be oxygen induced into the wine, and it's very critical that you're aware how much um, oxygen you, you pick up at these points. So now I will talk a little bit more about two scenarios we had at uh, UC Davis in our research winery. So the first scenario is from 2007. Actually, I can use this, no? Yeah. <laughs> from 2007. And this was in the, old, uh, in the old winery in Wixen Hall. And now we moved to a much nicer building, to the Robert Mondavi Institute. If you have the chance, you should come and visit us and see the new winery. Um, in any case, at this bottling in 2007, that was a research project for Nomacork. And uh, we, I was part of it. I will show you later which part I took of this. But um, our uh, head researcher, he was ordering a bottling line to bottle all the um, the wine, and um, what we realized after all the wine was bottled, that we had a DO of five milligrams per liter, which was a disaster and kind of embarrassing. So we realized that this mobile bottling uh, line, they didn't know what they were doing. Absolutely no clue. So you should watch out when you order someone doing mobile bottling that they know what they are doing and that they have the right equipment to check how much oxygen is induced during the bottling. So the, really the point was also we did no pre-trial, which I think is always important when you go to a much larger, um, uh, yeah, to your, to your real bottling, to a much larger project. So our response was we bottled everything by hand. I cannot remember how many bottles. Maybe you know this. There were a lot of bottles. Anyways, we bottled the whole research project was bottled by hand with this vacuum-driven filler, Enolmatic, and six people were doing the job. Um, we used nitrogen for blowing out the oxygen before bottling, 
And then also later, uh, when after filling, we were blowing out the headspace. And then we had the end result about one to two milligrams uh, total packaged oxygen. So here you can see uh, uh, like how we did it. That was in 2007 in the old winery. So uh, actually the glass was here, Mori was flushing uh, the bottles with nitrogen. Then Alex was filling the, bo the bottles with this enomatic. And then Selena, she uh, uh, put nitrogen again on the headspace. And I was sitting behind Mori and was giving the corks to Paul, who was then hand corking every bottle. And I think Jean-Baptiste was moving boxes. I mean, he was also involved. So it took a long time, and we were all very tired at the end of the day. Uh, so this is now, this is our new winery, and uh, we have a new bottling line set up. So we have house nitrogen 99.4%, which we can get anywhere we want. And um, so we have, this, uh, we have this nitrogen flowing here for, for, what is this? Okay. I didn't do this. So, okay. Uh, so we have nitrogen going here into the bottle. We have nitrogen in the filler bowl. And um, then we have liquid nitrogen. We have this nice uh, liquid, liquid nitrogen dripper. And this is going basically, the bottle is barged, it is filled, level adjusted, then a drop of liquid nitrogen, then Paul was putting the, the uh, capsule, it was a capsule, we were putting the capsule on, and then, uh, yeah, the bottle was later measured for total package oxygen. So you can see, um, ah, yeah, and also I have to mention that the tank was under nitrogen pressure. So you can see the tank had very little oxygen, 0.35 milligrams per liter. It, there was not much oxygen pick up in the filler bowl, and then we had a very, um, very low uh, total package oxygen, which varied from 0.6 to 2 milligrams per liter. Uh, but most of the, di the dissolved oxygen was below 0.5 milligrams per liter. So yeah, now in the next uh, slide, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, why uh, oxygen or total package oxygen is uh, really important at the at bottling, uh, or at the beginning of, basically that's the beginning of the wine aging. Um, I have here a paper from, from, it's from Germany, impact of dissolved oxygen at bottling on sulfur dioxide and sensory properties of Riesling. So Riesling is a very delicate uh, variety and is very prone to oxidation. So what they did, they uh, tried to, or they bottled, um, Riesling under different dissolved oxygen levels, which are low, medium, and high, one milligrams per liter, three milligrams per liter, and five milligrams per liter. And uh, they closed the bottles with two co-extruded closures and with one screw cap. But I, what I really want to, I don't want to go really into the closures. I just wanted to point out how important the dissolved, that the dissolved oxygen had really an influence, uh, a greater influence um, at the, for the sensory attributes than, than the closure itself. So you can see here the co-extruded high DO, co-extruded two high DO, and the screw cap high DO, they're all very different. And the ones which, um, uh, um, sorry, the, the effect of the, the, effect of the clo closure was, was less important than the initial dissolved oxygen at bottling. So how did we measure, how did we monitor our bottling line? Um, so we have these luminescent dots, the NomaSense, um, in, 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 uh, in our wine bottles. So we have, we have one in the liquid and one in the headspace to later calculate the total package oxygen. And um, yeah, this is a non-destructive test and the, the, the dot stays in, in the bottle and you can measure your oxygen uh, through the whole bottling line and follow uh, uh, what's going on in the bottle. And then uh, what's very nice, it comes with a dipping probe so you can measure all your liquids. So you can put the probe, this is the 
It's a very long probe. In, uh, you can put it into the tank, you can put it into the filler bowl, you could put it in your barrel so you can really uh, um, see how much oxygen you have in your liquids as well. That's all in one instrument. Um, there are other methods how to, to measure oxygen. So maybe you have a different, uh, already have a different um, instrument in your winery, which you could use to monitor your uh, oxygen. So there is the, there's a spectral method which uses a dye. So you, 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 um, you basically, um, you, you need to have a spectrophotometer and you need to, uh, you can check your oxygen, but only in a model wine. You cannot use real wine. So you could follow probably oxygen pickup in your, in your bottling line, but um, it's not really convenient for the winery. Uh, and then there is another probe, which is the orbisphere. And this would sacrifice always a bottle because you have to take the bottle out and um, you, have to, uh, you have to take the liquid out and then the bottle is basically gone. But it's very reliable and this had been, has been the benchmark for some time. Um, so what I want to say about or what our experience was for setting up a bottling line and, and for sampling is that you really should know and monitor your weak points uh, in your bottling line. Um, you should choose an oxygen measuring device that suits best your setup. And uh, you should consider how big is my, uh, my bottling run and choose a representative sample size to be really sure that, uh, that the DO um, is low and that, that you are consistent. So I always suggest to do a pre-trial and, and that you vi validate your own method before you do uh, your real, real bottling. So you don't have any surprises at the end. Yeah, now I would like to go a little bit into the chemistry. So why, um, how is, is uh, oxygen and SO2 playing together here? Um, so the SO2, your sulfur addition, um, will protect the wine. Um, it does not really react with the oxygen, and, um, but it will mop up all the oxidation products in your wine, like acid aldehyde, for example. In any case, what I want to say here is that as a rule of thumb, one milligram of oxygen will consume four milligrams of sulfides. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. This is, you should keep this in mind when you start uh, calculating basically from your, from your bottle dissolved, or, or from your um, total packaged oxygen and, and your SO2. So I will go into that in the next slide that probably we, in a good bottling line, we have maybe one to two milligrams of total packaged oxygen. And um, so for, if you think again about the, the uh, um, how you say the, for one milligram, that one milligram oxygen consumes four milligrams of sulfide, that when we have two milligrams of uh, total packaged oxygen, then we have a consumption of eight milligrams of SO2, um, like already during the, during the bottling process. And um, when we have four milligrams, which is pretty high of total packaged oxygen, then we have a consumption of uh, 60 milligrams of SO2. So you really should keep in mind to, to, to decide about your uh, free SO2, not like that's what I do before bottling. You should uh, decide what you want to have at the end in your bottle and, and, and consider um, and consider the um, consider this rule of thumb uh, how um, oxygen consumes, consumes the, the sulfur. Um, and then further, like post-bottling oxygen management, um, you can also, you should take this also in, in, into account. There are new closures on the rise with different oxygen ingress rates, and, um, and they, have, um, they have also many, uh, uh, other features, but um, I was just now I will focus on the oxygen ingress that uh, since you know your oxygen at uh, bottling and then you have a 
predictable um, oxygen transfer rate of your uh, closure, then you can calculate um, uh, how much oxygen has to come into each bottle. And like this, you can better anticipate an aging uh, trajectory, how your wine will age over time. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about some uh, research at UC Davis. So what we can offer to the uh, wine industry. Um, they, we, we could, um, there are many new closures, the, the, uh, many wine containers, new wine containers, new wine packaging. And UC Davis would like to perform more controlled and comprehensive studies uh, in an independent environment and, uh, and publish those so that uh, the industry um, has, has access, that everybody will benefit, for, um, will benefit this and that everybody will learn um, and improve their own uh, bottling in, in, the, in the winery. And the tools we have are basic chemistry and sensory analysis. And um, it is also, um, it is also, it's important to have these independent and, and studies at UC Davis since it will foster also analytical chemistry. Like there's a, I know that Dr. Waterhouse is working on um, analyzing free SO2, which will give the wine industry better, um, better tools to evaluate uh, chemical parameters. Um, and then also what could the wine industry could be part of is we, we are planning uh, to do a bottling workshop. Like maybe you know our 101 seminar series at the Department of Viticulture and Enology. So we usually invite representative speakers who uh, specialize in different fields and um, they, they give an int introduction to, to each topic. And what we are hoping um, what we are hoping to do out of this seminar series is, is uh, writing a technical manual for day-to-day -day uh, bottle troubleshooting in a winery, and uh, which everybody can have access to and can refer to. So thank you for uh, listening to me, and these are the acknowledgments. Uh, Noma Cork, G3, Dr. Waterhouse, Bruce Curry, who was doing the study in 2007, Maury Anderson, who is always working in Dr. Waterhouse lab and helping in all the studies. And um, also a big thank you to the UC Davis winery team, Chick Brenneman, Jessup Plotz, and Paul Green. Thank you. <laughs>